I'm Robin Crane, and this is the Growing Your Financial Business, The Woman's Way podcast. Listen, I was a financial advisor for over a decade, and I got so sick of the old archaic strategies that your grandpa used to get clients. What the industry teaches today is still so outdated and just doesn't work anymore. So I had to find a better way for myself, and then I got obsessed with sharing these how-tos with other women like me. The stuff I teach doesn't require giving up your life, your sanity, or your family time. I want women like you to have it easier than I had it so you can thrive in the industry. I've now helped thousands of women grow their financial businesses to multiple six figures, some even seven figures per year. So on this podcast, you're going to get an inside look at how they did it so you can do it too. Let's dive into the show. Welcome, welcome. I'm here with Deborah Smith and we've been chatting before recording, Um, but I'm excited to talk to Deborah because she's a baller. Can I call you a baller? I mean, super successful and thinks like, what? Of course, like I would just naturally get these results or some somehow just magically. So we want to know her story. Um, but she is the co-founder and CEO of the Center Cap Group, LLC, heads the firm's strategic capital and M&A and execution efforts prior to forming the Center Cap Group. Um, she uh, co-headed the, I'm trying to read this here, M&A, a co-head of M&A and a senior managing director of CB Richard Ellis Investors with 40 billion AUM. 40 billion. That's a B. That's a B billion. Okay. This is like, there's so much stuff here, but I just want to give you the, 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 the big things. Um, she also worked on mergers and acquisitions with Lehman Brothers, Wachovia Securities, Morgan Stanley. Uh, Deborah has been involved in more than $100 billion of mergers, acquisitions, and restructuring. Like, can you, can you even fathom this? Um, she's also from Australia, so we'll get the, the exciting accent, but billions, like that's a lot of money, girl. Like that's a lot of money. So yeah, tell us, let's start with your background because you were about to tell me and I'm like, don't know, let's save for the podcast because I want to be surprised, but kind of how you came about these opportunities and where you are now. Sure. So I moved to the United States about 20 years ago from Australia and I grew up in the country in a rural community on a dairy farm, no less. And um, my parents didn't go to high school. My brothers didn't go to college. In fact, my brothers didn't finish high school. Um, and so I'm a bit of an odd duck um, when it comes to them. And, and I think, you know, I'm, I'm one of those people that didn't have the parent that guided them where they're supposed to go in life. And I've kind of fallen into it. And I think now I look back on time and I, I don't know how I got here, but here I am. Um, so I started Morgan Stanley in Australia. I got a double degree there, one in economics, one in law. And then I moved with Morgan Stanley to the US and was on loaner and never left. And so I've been here ever since. And I've moved around a couple of firms, a few firms. I've had four kids along the way. I've got a husband as well and a great business partners. And we set up our own shop as a boutique investment bank focused only on the real estate space 13 years ago, 13 years ago at this point. So which brings me here I am today. That's crazy. So it sounds like you were just like super smart though. Like not everybody is like that smart. You had a, a double degree in what did you say? Law and yeah, law. economics. Yeah. And economics. Like yeah. <laughs> I hardly know what economics means and I definitely could not go anywhere into law. I've often reflected on as I've gotten older, what the trigger was. Cause as a 10th grader, I wasn't even going to college. I mean, college was just not something that you do. And it wasn't on, as a priority. It wasn't even something I thought about. It wasn't like, do I want to go or not go? It wasn't even on the radar. It's, that's not the way things get done. And so I just happened to move to a school um, and I got a teacher, my economics teacher, actually, who actually thought I wasn't too stupid. And, and so I, with some, I think a lot of hard work, because uh, that's where you come from as dairy farmers, is that you, the one thing I've gotten from it is you work hard. You're very persistent. You have a lot of patience. You start at 5 in the morning and you're well into the afternoon and everyone has jobs and responsibilities from a very young age. And, and so I think I've carried that as I've gotten older. And when I buckled down as an 11th grader, um, moving forward with my schoolwork and having a great teacher suggested to me, I should think about going to university. Wow. I was like, wow, how, how, I mean, how, to, and honestly, I only picked economics law because it was the hardest thing to get into other than medicine law. And so I was like, I'll give it a whirl. And I got in, I, you know, I did really well. I wait, 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 can we back up a step? So you picked it only because it was the hardest thing. Why, why hardest. would you do that? I was the second hardest. I couldn't do medicine law because um, I'm not very good with blood. And so I picked the next thing, which was economics law at the time. 
and which is a, it was a double degree. So I went to school for six years as undergrad. And yeah, I picked it because it turns out I wasn't a bad student when I put my mind to it. And, and that's literally, I remember filling out the piece of paper and saying, I'll put this down and I'll put this school. And I got in. I but surprised. why would you like, were you trying to avoid going back to the dairy farm? Like, why would you want a, like a, a double major in something like second hardest thing? Like, I'm just um, curious, like why you would put yourself up against that. And, and it's admirable. And it's, I've done things like that as well, but I'm like, why, why is it the challenge? Is it because you knew you could now? Is it your teacher was encouraging you? I just think, look, the reality is, is I did really well in school. Once I buckled down on it and I got in a school where they had good teachers and the teachers actually cared about the students. And, and I had people invest time in me as a student. And I hadn't, you know, I didn't have a lot of that before. And, and teachers can make such a huge difference in people's lives. I cannot understate if you have a good teacher, how much value they can change your life forever. And I remember those teachers, they were my, my economics teachers and my math teacher, my chemistry teacher. And it's, I think the skill is, um, I picked it because, and I look back on this, it never has occurred to me ever in my lifetime that I can't do something. Mm. And it's not like I sit there and say, can I, can't, it just doesn't come into my head. It's like, well, I'm going to apply on this. Okay, I'm going to apply to it. That's what I'm going to do. Um, and I don't sit there and think, um, Am I smart enough? Am I good enough? Can I do this? Can I not do it? I don't, it just doesn't come into my mind at that point in time. And now I look at it and say, well, why didn't you think that? But I just didn't. Um, and so I put it down and if I get in, I get in, but I have parents who had no pressure. So if I ended up working in a grocery store, that would have been fine. Um, and so there was no expectation, zero from my family that I would ever go on and do any of these things. Um, when I got into law school, when I actually got in, um, I remember my dad told my mother and I heard saying, how's Debbie gonna survive in a man's world? And those concepts, I just were not in my head. Maybe if I had, if I would have thought about it more, but I just didn't. And I was like, you know what, I'm gonna apply to this course and I'll put in for this course. And it just didn't occur that maybe I wouldn't make it. It just only occurred that that's what I've put down. And, and if it happens, then it, if I don't get in, oh, well, well, I'll do something else. But when you have such a low bar of expectation, it's, it's you know, it's really easy to meet. <laughs> that's, hilarious. that's really interesting because it's, it's like, you know, you think and you, you know, I've heard about studies of, you know, uh, Asians who are coming to America and the expectations are so high. And, and there was actually something I just was listening to through Tony Robbins and he was talking about priming and he was talking about how, if you tell someone, I can't, I think it was something like, I, I wish I could remember the exact thing, but it was like, if you tell these, these women before they take a test that most women don't do as well as men, then they, they don't do as well. And then I if think that's tell, right. And if it's like Asian, you know, like they said, Asian, um, uh, Americans or whatever they, or they come here or something. And he was saying that the expectation is that they're going to perform well in math and science and stuff. And then they do because like this priming, this expectation that's set in front of them. And it's really interesting that you're saying, the opposite, like there was like this low expectation, this low bar. And then what you're telling me right now is like the difference between like you succeeding and not succeeding or the, the reason why you're succeeding more than let's just probably say 90, 99% of the world, or at least women in the world, let's say if we're comparing it, it's because, because women unfortunately don't have as many opportunities, but it's like, like, because you didn't think you could fail. Like you didn't care about failing. You were unattached yeah. to the result and your mindset, like it's all mindset. Like you're just like, okay, what, what, what? What, what could happen? Like, what's, so, what's the worst that can happen? And I think most of us are going through every single day as a woman going like, I'm going to be judged. I'm not going to be accepted. I'm not going to be loved. I'm not going to belong. Not those words, but that's what we're thinking is that I'm not enough. Like all the things you said, I'm not smart enough. I'm not good enough. I'm, I'm you know, I, I'm not, I don't, I'm not going to belong. There's going to be all these men and, you know, they're going to look down on me and all this stuff. And like, how did you not get that gene? And where did I, you find that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, I had my first child at Morgan Stanley and I was young. I was very young. To, and in fact, I didn't know anyone. It was unheard of for me to have a child that young. And I got to tell you, I mean, it never occurred to me then either that I shouldn't. I, I was just doing it my own way. My husband and I, we wanted, we were, we'd been married and I wanted a child. And that's just what I did. And, and I, I just, I just, I went into it unassuming. There was no decision, should I, shouldn't I? This is what we wanted to do and we're doing it. And, and I remember going in and telling folks in the office, and I honestly think now when I look back, it's because I didn't assume that they weren't going to be okay with it, that they were actually okay with it. 
And and when we had our when we had our baby and I took it into the office, the men with stay-at-home women were picking up this child. It was awkward, but it never occurred to me that they shouldn't. <laughs> it's like this is just the way I, I'm doing it my way, and I just do things, and I just assume. Um, actually, I don't even think whether they're going to work out or not. I just have a really big belief is um, if I'm going to do something, I do it the best I can, number one. Number two, I set unreasonably high expectations. But if I don't get them, and this is what I tell all my kids, aim high, but if you don't reach it, you can't beat yourself up over it. You, you have to cut yourself some slack, right? Because that's the whole point of setting high expectations is to reach beyond your level, right? But if you can't, this is where I think women go sideways all the time is if they set an expectation, they worry and spend too much time thinking about whether I can do it, can I can't do it, all the things that can go wrong. And if this happens, that, who cares? Just, just do it. And if it goes wrong, trust your instincts, you'll figure it out because you will. It's, mm-hmm. it's women I find have amazing intuition. It's amazing, so much better than guys. And we never, we don't listen to it. Well, I listen to it, but most people don't listen to it. And when you're a tummy gut, which is really internal judgment, says, give it a whirl, you should give it a whirl. And if it doesn't work out, okay, so what? You'll figure it out. And when you get there, but don't sabotage your own chances before you've even started. I I don't, why, women do it all the time and I see it all the time as why women are poor executors a lot of times in business is because they spend so much time thinking about the what ifs. Stop thinking about the what ifs and just do it. That's what I say. It's so good. I feel like you, you naturally just had that, like, and I have some, to some degree of that, but I'm fighting it a lot more than you, like where I'm, I've done personal development and I've worked on myself to be like, stop listening to that voice. And then I do feel like I have really good intuition when I follow my intuition, I get what I want. And then I, at this stage, like after having, uh, you know, two babies and one was IVF and one, I feel like we completely manifested after because we were like, you know, two years later, basically like, just, I, I was like, this is what I want. I could just manifest it instead of like having to do that. <laughs> I mean, it's a little bit longer story than that, but basically, but I, I've had to keep silencing that, that voice. That's like, you can't do this. It's not going to work all these things. And, and even like sometimes daily, like I have that battle of like, uh, it, and I don't think it's as, as obvious as you're not good enough. It shows up in different ways, but it's, and it's not necessarily a, a very clear feeling of, of, I don't know, not, not, not having the confidence or something, but it's, it's almost, but there's a fear. I think there's just like this fear. Yeah. And, and like that, that's definitely with me is some sort of fear. Like, like right now I have a, a pretty big team and it's like, I know we, we will probably do well this year and we're doing, you know, we're doing fine and stuff, but it's like, you keep adding to the team. You keep growing your expenses, you keep taking yourself to a next level. And then there's more and more pressure and more and more pressure and more and more pressure. And it, it's happening differently this year than it did before for me that like the more people I get on my team and the more we grow, it's like the more pressure I feel and a little bit more yeah. fear because I have all these other people relying on me because it's different. Like if I fail now, I have to like lay off people, you know, before if I failed, like I just, I have to figure it out and I can always yeah. figure it out. But I think that's, there's layers of it, but I, I agree with you that a lot of the women who aren't successful, who could be successful. Um, and I say this, I have this five day challenge and I say like, what would you be? Who would you be? Where would you be? If you didn't have this fear of judgment, right? Because it's mostly the fear of judgment. And like, it seems it like is. you just didn't get that gene. And like, we, we got to like remove it because if we didn't have that fear of judgment, it, you'd think like a guy. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I think there's some degree of fear of judgment, but yeah, there'd be a lot more advantages like a guy. That's right. You think like a guy. And I I have this joke with one of my business partners all the time. It's, you know, how do women survive investment banking when there's so few women? At the C-suite level where we are now, um, I don't know where they all went. I mean, I started in a class, maybe it was 20% women, maybe. But somewhere along the line, we look now, we look around, we go, where did everybody go? Um, and all of our clients are guys, and I don't spend a whole lot of time thinking about it, but I, Lisa and I, you know, it's, uh, we often say it's, you know, you gotta, it's you, you gotta put away, women are awesome nurturers. They're, they're nurturers. That's what we are. We're emotional nurturers. And maybe I don't have that gene, um, because, you know, I, I don't, I don't get too emotional about things. And so that's why I don't second guess stuff. I don't, worry that, yeah, sure, I would like to succeed and there's a slight, you know, there's a fear maybe if I don't, but I use that as motivation. I don't use it as a, as a hindrance to say I'm not going to do it. 
And I think it's that fear of wanting to be successful, um, which is a very guy trait. It's the, the wanting to be successful and wanting to, to move forward. I use it as an inspiration, right? It's the thing that pushes me forward. And so whether it's, you know, cleaning my dishes or making the bed or driving my kids somewhere, everything I do is I want it to be perfect and it has to be excellent. And I put 120% into everything, regardless of the task. But if, if it's not the end result, um, is not what I want it to be. It is what it is. And, and then I just let it go. And so you don't get to blame other people and you can't, you know, it's all on you. Um, and you have the capability and you got to get out there and change the answer. So if you don't like it, do something about it. But your five minutes of pity. And I remember my daughter said to me one day, she says, Mom, why can't you just feel sorry for me just for a few minutes? I said, I did. And the time has passed. Um, <laughs> the time has passed. And now Alexa it's time to move on. a five minute timer. That's what we would do. It's like Alexa said a five minute timer. And then, you know, everybody. But you can't change like, it. I mean, if something doesn't yeah. work out, you can't change it. I mean, why spend all this time? There's only so many hours in the day. Why spend time and energy wallowing in what went sideways and, you know, how you're disappointed, you're upset, or you're crying, whatever it is? You can't change it. All you can do is figure out why and then do things differently and, and, and change it for the next time or the next outcome. Because it's not, I mean, we all have successes and failures. And the only thing holding you back is how you choose to process the bad, right? The good's great, but it's how you choose. And these are all personal choices, right? You can, you can decide how any step back in life, you can decide how you use that. Um, and some, you know, some people let it sink them. And, and my attitude is, is I wallow on it for five minutes and say life sucks. And then I keep on going uh, and I move forward and I use it as a motivation to Look, change the next outcome. I, I have a couple of questions and I'm, I'm going to tell say it twice because I'll probably forget if I don't. So one is like, how do you differentiate between just taking five minutes, wallowing in it and then letting go versus burying it inside where it's probably affecting you physically? To yeah. point where, Cause you're like, like I've lost money and, and whatever, everyone who's successful has lost money. So I'm like, Oh, cool. Now I got the badge of honor. But like the initial reaction was like, Oh my God. You know, like, and I can't like, what I, why I didn't, why didn't I do that? Why did I do that? What, you know, all these things. And, and then like, I felt like I was starting to get over it. And I was like, I can't focus on that. This is part of my badge of honor to become more successful. Like this is actually awesome. And I'm really trying to like, feel that and like, get that, like you have this unattachment that I have to, I have to make more of an effort to like, okay, I'm going to be unattached to that because I can't change it and all these things, but I'm like strong arming it. And then like it passes, like every day gets easier. Every day gets easier. Yeah. So eventually kind of passes. But to some degree, I feel like some of those mistakes, I, when I then focus back on it, I'm like, I can almost feel it in my gut. Yeah. You know? So that's, that's the main question. But so I don't forget the second one is like, when did something really horrible happen to you? that you were able to only wallow in it for five minutes and then really move on. Like something like the worst thing that's happened to you. I'd love to hear that. Like if you have one. I think, I mean, the, the near ones, which happen in our business all the time, every time we lose a big deal and it happens and I'm just like, seriously. And I get so, I can't believe this. And I get mad about it and I whine and complain about it. And I'll call my partners and whine and complain. And then it's like, you know, but after that moment, it's, Okay, well, moment's done. I only have so much time to complain about it. And that I am good at. It's like, well, this isn't getting me anywhere. My, the time has passed. I just got to keep going. But then I do reflect on those things and say, well, where did we go wrong? And I think one of the reasons we're in business to this day and why we've survived and grown is I'm good at that. It's, it's saying, well, that didn't work um, or we missed it because of this. So let's break it down as to why very clinically <laughs> as to why and what do we need to do different um, so that it doesn't happen the next time. And, and I think, you know, it's adaptability and ex mixing in execution and, and that happens. And I mean, you know, some of our deals, they're big deals. And so if you miss something, it really sucks. I mean, it totally sucks. And when you say big, like just so they can feel that, like, yeah, I mean, these are all seven figure, some, you know, fees for us. I mean, these are big deals. Yeah. Um, and so, and they happen. And, and you know, I, I think it's good in layering in and saying, look, I, you know, we may have lost it, but let's let's focus on all these other things. Or what did they do that we can mirror or we can learn from that they do? 
and, and I do think, you know, I tend not to get overly subjective and emotional about things that, that I don't. And I just don't think there's room for that. I, I don't, uh, we have too many things going on and my day is too busy and I have too many things I need to get through to really wallow in some of those things. Um, I just don't have the time. And so that little thing in your gut that says, oh, this sucks, and you, you belabor it, I just like move on. I can't, I just don't have time to deal with this. I and just you think don't. like for someone who does that, as far as the first question, just like, is it, is it the same? Like, is it like, okay, I'm just letting go of this or it's like, it's stuck in my body and going to cause me like, cancer, yeah. you know what I mean? Stop like, thinking like, about it. It's practice. I, I mean, we're, we're all women. I mean, it's, it's just practice. It's, and when you have, cause it's negative energy, right? It's just energy that is sucking you away from something that is more productive, can make money in my business or distract me from doing something that I should be doing somewhere else. You just have to squash it and say, say to yourself mentally, I don't have time for this. Mm. I've got to move on. And it's probably going to sleep, keep you up at night. I hear you. It's going to keep you up at night. But during the day, when you get yourself up, you got to move on and squash it down to the bottom at the, at the pile, bottom of the pile I said, I can't deal with this right now. I just need to focus on stuff that is going to move me forward. And hopefully over time, the, the negative shit just stays where it is and stops interfering. But I, I do think good and bad, you know, you deserve that five minutes. And so even with things that are great, but by the opposite token, when things are amazing and we have massive wins, I'm like, let's just focus on five minutes. This is awesome. Let's just great high five and then let's move on. That's funny. <laughs> you know, it's just Interestingly enough, um, when I did experience this financial loss, like that I felt was totally my fault. Uh, I was at this event with some amazing women. And one of these ladies is actually Australian. Her name's Jackie Bauka. Jack Bauka. I'll probably have her on the podcast and she'll tell me how to pronounce it. But, um, and she does like intuitive healing and stuff. And, and basically like I lied down on the couch and she just like help, helped me just experience that loss. And like, it was yeah. more than five minutes, but it was probably 20 minutes where I was lying down and just thinking about this, she called it the situation of what happened and not necessarily what I, I mean, I'm already learning from what I did wrong. Like I'll evaluate and I can do that without the emotion, but it was the emotional part of feeling yeah. like I, 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 I made mistakes and I, sh this shouldn't have happened to me versus like, okay, there's such learning and this is happening to me for a reason. And, and like, it's, it, I came out of that 20 minutes and there's, te there were tears like dripping down my eyes. I mean, I was like really associated to it and I experienced it. And then I came out of it going like, okay, it's not about me. Make it was only 60 grand, but it felt like a lot. Cause I lost it in two days. Um, and it was <laughs> like coming out of it. I was like, okay, it's not that I'm going to like learn something here or meet someone because it happened. And that's going to make me another 60 grand to make up for it. It's like, who am I becoming by having that and shifting who I am and how I react to things and how I make decisions. And as an entrepreneur and as someone growing their personal wealth and all these things, like, who am I becoming? And that is going to be worth millions, you know, right. is like the shaping of me. And yeah. so I came out of that actually, like, I don't now, I'm not, I'm thinking about it now. I'm talking about it now. I'm not crying. It's like, I'm not like associated to it. And I think actually it'd be hard for me to go back to that place where I was really upset about it because I did decide to move on very intentionally. And I think like, if we could do that every day, like you, like I'm really noticing the difference between you as a successful entrepreneur, successful woman with four kids and all these things. And and a lot of women, let's say even in my programs who are striving to make that whatever, maybe it's only hundred grand, maybe it's a million, but they're striving to do that. And it's all mindset. I can teach them all the strategy, but I got to yeah. work on their mindset like all day long because it's constantly those beliefs that are opposite of yours yeah. that are like, I can't get over it. I'm not good enough. I'm like, who am I to be doing this? I don't, you know, I, I I'm broken. I'm a financial advisor or whatever it is. And like this constant negative thoughts that they're battling. That yeah. up against that they have to defend against that are actually causing more negativity or more lack or, or the lack of success. Yeah. That's why you get your five minutes of lulling and self-pity. <laughs> but it's like, it's negativity. And I just, you know, when setting high expectations, which I definitely do, they're very, very high. It's like, but if you don't get it, cut yourself some slack. I mean, you know, that's why you set these expectations. Don't be too hard on yourself. And, and I know it's harder than how I say it, but I work, I, the part, I work at a two, 
But I, I, I think it's just because I set the next set of objectives. Once, if something's done, I set the next set of objectives and I just move on from it. Um, and cut yourself the slack. And I tell the kids too, it's cut yourself some slack, right? It's, you got to strive and you got to continue to push forward. But nobody's perfect. And, and I am a very big believer, huge believer in open and closed doors to you wouldn't believe how I'm crazy about this concept that if something's not working out, then I'm telling you, it's just to me, God's plan, it's going to switch gears and another door is going to open. The trick will be is to keep your eye out for it, right? Because life is full of t- tricks and turns and round. And it's part of the reason I'm not, and every person will hate me for saying this, I'm not a long-term planner at all. I, I don't. I, I feel like if you set long-term plans, you miss all the good stuff, right? All the open and closed doors where stuff comes up and you may push it aside and say, well, wait a second. And I just had lunch with someone yesterday and an opportunity had come up. And I said to her, I said, well, wait a second. Well, why aren't you looking at that? She goes, oh, because it would require these changes. I said, well, hang a second. But why is that a bad thing? Let's just, let's just flesh this out for a little minute, a, a minute. It, and I said to her, if there is no harm in exploring, explore, see where it goes. It may go nowhere, but if this is something that's got a little tickle of excitement and you're, you want to look at it, push it forward and control your destiny on it. And if you don't take it, at least you explored it and you went through that process, but don't just turn it down because you've dismissed it, outs it because of, there's no because of, let's just, let's just think it through. Because to me, I hear that and I'm like, hang on a second, there's an opportunity there. Why, why would you not be looking at that? Um, and we've built our business like that where we continue to shift gears as the market flows and I see something, I'm like, wait a second, why, why shouldn't we be looking at that? Why can't we do that? Um, and, and continuing to evolve it through. And, and sometimes, you know, we end up spending more effort maybe on some things versus others, but I never let that be a deterrent. It's, it's, someone had said to me when I was young in my career, very young, it was a woman, said to me, Deb, never second guess the decisions you make because you can't change them. Mm-hmm. So make the decision, move on, don't look back. I was an associate, first year associate. And, and I, I've hugged on to things like that. And because if you, if you don't get out of that, you miss all the good stuff. And life is so full of cool, amazing opportunities if you choose to embrace them when they show up. But you gotta, you gotta be on the, out, the lookout for them um, and, and just have the smarts to figure out when you should chase it and pursue it versus the rabbit hole. Awesome. I not always that. easy to do. It's, it's not, look, I'm not trying to make it sound easy. It's not, I, I just... You know, I, I just with so many things in every single day, I have, I am a process of getting through. And my husband just said to me the other day, he's like, you know, Deb, I know there's no deliverable in this, but can you just, because my, my approach to everything is what, are, what, all right, what, what's the issue? What's the problem? And I think if I have a fault, it's I approach to everything is, well, okay, well, hang on, what are we trying to do here? Or what's the answer? Or what's the solution? What do you need me to do um, in terms of pushing things through. Um, and, and I would say for, for women out there with that whole fear issue, what's helped me, um, and it doesn't have to be exactly the same, but I'm a big runner. And I, when I talk run, I run a lot. Uh, I'm a huge runner. And I, I find running um, to me, and whether it's swimming or music or reading, whatever it is, it allows you to switch gears and focus on something without focusing on it at all. Um, and for those who are worried about indecision or they're worried about fear and, and what they can and can't achieve, take yourself offline and, and go do something that is completely unrelated to it um, and give your brain a rest. Because I find if whenever I allow my brain to take a break like that, particularly when I'm running, I have come up with so many amazing solutions, solutions to deal negotiations, coming up with compromises, new pitch ideas. Everything, new business ideas, I have come up with running, foot on the pavement, and it just comes to me when I'm thinking of absolutely nothing at all. Just listen to some good old-fashioned country music. Nice. Awesome. Well, this has been amazing. I, I love it because it's just, it's just so, so much mindset, but I think what's also really interesting about you is that you can tell that you're, you just extract things and then use them versus you know some people hear the same lesson again and again. They have to learn it or hear it 10 times and then make the mistake how many yeah. times before they get it. And it seems like it's like, oh, well, this, this one teacher 
affected my life like this. This one person said this one thing when I was an associate and it changed my life forever because you're like extracting the value, extracting the value, extracting the value. And it's like, if we're looking for that, we're looking for value and just, you make a decision and don't look back. It's like some women in my program, it's like, it's scary for them. They jump into my program and it's like, maybe they don't have the money and they find the money and they jump in. It's like, cause they know intu intuitively that they want those things. They know they need the help to get those things. And it's like, just like teachers, like they see the value, like I can get this with yeah. your help. And then the only reason they're not getting it as fast or not getting to where they want to be is because of that fear. Or, oh, maybe I shouldn't have yeah. done this. Or like looking back, it's like to trust your intuition yes. and go with it and then follow yes. through, follow yes. through. So yes, we're <laughs> drinking the same Kool-Aid. Thanks, Deborah. I appreciate it. I love it. Um, anywhere. I mean, I don't know if they, is there somewhere to follow you? I mean, I don't know if you're putting up a, a bunch of social media or, if, or someone else wants you on podcast. What's the best way, way to find you? Uh, so you can get me on LinkedIn, Deborah Smith Seneca cup. I should pop right up. We, the company has a web has also has LinkedIn under the Seneca cup group and we have a website and that's the extent of our, our social media presence. Like I said, there's only so many hours in the day, right? Right. <laughs> only so much you can do. So, you know, we pick our things and then we are, we're all in on them. Uh, and that's the, the easiest way. Obviously on our website, there's my phone number and email. I have, I take lots of calls and anytime anybody has a question, I'm always open. If I can help someone get through things and I'm always around. Wow. That is quite generous of you. And I'll be the first one to call. Um, so and no, we can have lunch. <laughs> yeah, we can have lunch. We live near each other. That's awesome. Uh, well, thank you so much. And thank you all for listening. We'll see you next time on Growing Your Financial Business the Woman's Way. Bye. I actually have the link for the tag challenge, the appointment generator challenge. So instead, you can just go to femalefinancialadvisors.com and register right now so that you can get five quality appointments in just five days. Now, this is not around you, know, you having to talk to friends and family and get all awkward. This is not about you having to spend marketing dollars online or create a whole funnel. This is going to be easy. It's simple. It happens in five days. If I can get you five quality appointments in five days, then you know that you can have the best year of your life because you just need to get in front of more of the right people. We will walk through it together as we do it. So do not miss this. And if you can, if you're smart, do VIP, spend a few extra bucks and you can actually spend time with me on Zoom where I can connect with you, get to know you and really help you get those quality appointments so that you can grow your business. And um, go ahead again, register at femalefinancialadvisors.com. You'll find it all there. It's happening, coming up very, very soon. So make sure to register, claim your spot, get in on this, get excited about it, block your calendar because you need to spend about an hour to an hour and a half uh, a day with me on the Thursday, Friday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, so that you can get these results and it does work. The most appointments I think we got in those five days, uh, someone I think it was Dana got 33 appointments. So you could be my best student and go well beyond the five quality appointments. Go to 10, go to 15, go to 20 and set your, yourself up for the best year ever. Can't wait to see you at the tag challenge. See you there. Thank you again for listening to Growing Your Financial Business the Woman's Way.